Hello, welcome to the Archives and History Library. I'm Chuck Ockletree, and uh, historian here, and I'm going to do the introductions. Before we get started this evening, though, I'd like to mention a few of our upcoming events. Next Thursday, on July 19th, Kyle Warmack will present Vanishing Act, Rediscovering the South Charleston Naval Ordnance Plant. Kyle will discuss the origins and development of the plant and his efforts to create the South Charleston Interpretive Center's upcoming Ordnance Plant exhibit, which will open on September 3rd. Two weeks from tonight, we will present the block series. On July 26th, uh, Charleston native and Huntington resident Sim Fryson will discuss his experiences in the car industry, among other things. For other upcoming events and activities, please check our website, wvculture.org backslash history, or our Facebook page. Tonight, Dr. Joe Wyatt, professor emer emeritus professor at Marshall University, contributing columnist for the Charleston Gazette Mail, and author of several books, including The Breaking Point, Killing and Other True Cases of Murder and Malice, a West Virginia forensic psychologist remembers, um, and a collection of articles that he's published in the Charleston Gazette. Um, we'll speak on his new book, Quagmire in Babylon, A History of the Iraq War, 1998 to 2018. He has all three of these books over here for sale afterwards, and I'm sure he'll be happy to sign any if anybody would like them. Uh, the Breaking Point Killing and Other True Cases of Murder and Malice and the Quagmire and Babylon book are both $20. His collection is $16. Um, many West Virginians served in the Iraq War, which began more than 15 years ago in March 2003. Questions remain as to why the war was fought, what was gained, and what was lost. Uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Wyatt will describe events leading to the evasion, the push to Baghdad, and many of the outcomes for both Iraq and the U.S., including Iraq's descent into civil war despite the efforts of those who served. Dr. Wyatt's son, Dan, is with us this evening, and as an aside, Dan and I both went to high school together. I've actually known Dan since fourth grade. I can remember his uh, grandfather coming in and performing magic tricks for us. <laughs> um, Dan was a Marine Corps, he was in the Marine Corps and vet, served two tours in Iraq, and he will offer, also offer his insight on the war. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wyatt. Thanks very much for coming. We are a small but mighty group, and um, I'm really pleased that uh, you're interested in this topic. And it does seem impossible, almost, that it was in March 15 years since the invasion of Iraq. Um, but anyway, that is that. And what I want to do is uh, talk to you a little bit tonight about this war. And um, kind of, and we've had enough time go by that we can take an historic look back and really get a feel for what happened and, and so on. Um, how we got into it, what happened during the war, where are things now in Iraq and so on. And it's a messy topic that's tough to get into. I, and of course my wife is here, uh, Barbara, we followed the war very closely because our son was in it. He, uh, Daniel was one of the first two or three hundred Marines, he tells me, across the line of departure, the boundary from uh, northern Kuwait into Iraq at the start of the invasion and spent uh, two tours in Iraq and 15 months of his life trying to shake the sand out of his shorts and, <laughs> and um, get through that, which he did. And he'll be talking to you a little bit uh, in the second half of this presentation, but to start with, to me, when if somebody asked me who are the heroes of this war, right there are several of them. And the fellow on the right is Dan, who's here tonight. I thought that was a nice picture of uh, a little group, not a full squad maybe, but uh, who were uh, in the war. So that said, and there are other heroes too, but that said, um, oops, got to turn it on. Going back, even though the invasion was in March of 2003, 
I started this look back five years prior to that. Um, in 1998, when Bill Clinton was still president, uh, there was a group of people, they were called neoconservatives by the media and maybe themselves, and they were all in favor of an invasion of Iraq, even going back that far. Uh, they called themselves the Project for the New American Century, and one of their precepts, the main precept, was that the rest of the world, starting with Iraq, should be made in the image of America, that is a Western democratic type of government. And another precept was we would use American military might to go to Iraq, smash the Saddam Hussein regime, establish a Western democratic type government, and once that was done, the neighboring countries in the Middle East would see how good it was, and like a row of dominoes, one after another, these other nations would adopt the same kind of Western democratic form of government and lifestyle that we have. <coughs> now, I think we know that that didn't happen. Not even close. Uh, so they wrote a letter, this group, to Bill Clinton. And they said, we need to invade Iraq because Saddam has weapons of mass destruction and um, we need to knock him out of power. Now some of the people who signed that letter, there were 20 or so people in this group. Uh, names you'll recognize, starting with uh, John Bolton up on the upper right, who is uh, thought of as a, a major war hawk even today and recently if you recall, he became President Trump's national security advisor. Uh, Mr. Bolton, uh, to show you what sort of a war hawk he is, he once said something to the effect that uh, the United Nations would be better if the top 10 floors of the, its building were blown off or removed or something. Two others under him, Richard Pearl and Paul Wolfowitz, a little bit uh, less known, they uh, were signers of this letter to Bill Clinton and they later became top uh, assistants in the Department of Defense to Donald Rumsfeld, who you see to the left in the middle. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, of course, uh, became George W. Bush's Secretary of Defense and was a huge promoter of the invasion of Iraq. Two others there, William Crystal is a journalist uh, who you see on uh, some of the news programs fairly often. He was uh, pushing for the Iraq War and Richard Armitage, a longtime uh, Republican political operative. So those are some names you may remember. Bill Clinton read their letter and said, no, we're not going to invade Iraq. We don't think that there's enough reason to do that. But then things changed on January 20th, 2001, when uh, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney were inaugurated. And interestingly enough, that opened the door to uh, the war in Iraq. Now, this fellow uh, was George W. Bush's Secretary of the Treasury, a guy named Paul O'Neill. And um, as Secretary of the Treasury, that made him a member of the National Security Council that advises the President on matters of security. And Paul O'Neill later wrote a book and he said, Within a week after uh, George W. Bush was inaugurated, at the first National Security Council meeting, George W. Bush said, Saddam must go. Now, of course, that's nine months prior to the, the attack of 9-11. Another guy is this fellow, Richard Clark. He was the head of national security for counterterrorism under several presidents, starting with uh, the first President Bush, also Bill Clinton, and then uh, second President Bush. And he has said in some of his writings and public presentations that he tried and tried to get a meeting with uh, Condoleezza Rice, who was George W. Bush's uh, first national security advisor or Dick Cheney to advise them about counterterrorism, particularly the threat from Al-Qaeda. 
And over the next nine months, leading up to the attack of 9-11, they refused to meet with him, he says, because he feels their focus was on Iraq. Um, so there were some warnings uh, from some substantial people with track records that we needed to be looking at things a little differently. And then this happened. And our lives changed forever. Who can forget that? Everybody remembers where they were and what they were doing. I had just... Um, Daniel was uh, in the service in the Marine Corps at that time. And I had just packed up a care package to send to him at his base uh, out in California. And uh, I dropped it off at the post office and then driven on down to Marshall University to uh, teach a class. And when I came out of that class, uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning, this was what was on television. Later in that day, Donald Rumsfeld, now Secretary of Defense, had a meeting and talked with top aides about how to respond to this attack. And Rumsfeld was known for taking copious notes about uh, everything when he had meetings. And much later, years later, when his notes about that meeting that day were revealed, one of his written comments was that the U.S. must hit Saddam. So that quickly, the thought was whoever did this must have been involved with Saddam Hussein. Uh, or at least it would be a rationale to hit Saddam. And as things went along in the next year and a half or so, leading up to the invasion in March of 2003, um, there was a, an escalation in the rhetoric for war. The drumbeat for war was, was uh, continuing. A good example was the most important um, speech that a president can make, State of the Union Address, where uh, George Bush described Iraq as an ax part of an axis of evil, and maybe it was. Um, in March of 2002, uh, the following month then, uh, after that State of the Union speech on British TV, uh, Bush said, I've made up my mind that Saddam must go. Now that sounds a little strange because he was telling us at home that he was giving Saddam Hussein warnings, get rid of your weapons of mass destruction, and da 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 da. But here, and it's not a secret, I mean it's on TV, it's a tape, you know. But he had said this as early as March 2002, a, a full year prior to the invasion. In the summer, in June, George W. Bush was the featured speaker at the West Point commencement where he told um, the soon-to-be officers graduating that day that if we wait for Saddam's threats, weapons of mass destruction, to materialize, we will have waited too long. And there was just this kind of ongoing bunch of uh, talk in speeches, on TV, etc. The following month, the uh, British Home Secretary, a guy named Jack Straw, now that's Britain's version of the Secretary of State, he and a colleague had been visiting Washington, talking with top Bush officials, Bush administration officials, and he went home and he told uh, Tony Blair, the Prime Minister and other members of Tony Blair's cabinet in a meeting, he said, it seemed clear, and this is from uh, contemporaneous notes uh, or uh, transcript, of that meeting, it seemed clear that Bush had made up his mind to invade Iraq, essentially, even though um, the case was thin. Um, a very interesting kind of proposition. This is what became known later as the Downing Street Memo. But we didn't know it, and it didn't, wasn't revealed at the time. It was a couple of years later, after the war was well underway that this was revealed. Uh, the following month, in August of 2002, so now we're about six months prior to the invasion, uh, we have uh, Vice President Cheney making a speech to the veterans of foreign wars. And in it, he said, there is no doubt 
that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it sort of convinced me that it must be true that all of this talk was going on. Uh, we've got first-hand testimony from defectors including Saddam's own son-in-law, General Kamal. But what Dick Cheney did not tell his audience that day is that this fellow had been dead for six years. He and another had defected from Iraq, another general, and Saddam sort of lured them back saying, oh, all will be forgiven, just come on back home. And they kind of took that bait and General Kamal and the other fellow went back and Saddam had, Saddam had them killed. Um, also that day, Dick Cheney left this out of his speech. Um, he didn't say that actually what General Kamal had told uh, U.S. officials during his defection was that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So it's a pretty blatant thing to have done by our vice president to justify his desire for a war. Also that same month, uh, there is an agency of the United Nations called the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Administration, um, and they had an uh, agency, International Atomic Energy Agency, right? they had issued a report in August of 2002, uh, again about six months before the invasion, saying that um, Bush in a recent news conference was wrong. Bush had said uh, that an IAEA report claimed that Saddam was six months from developing a weapon of mass destruction, a nuclear bomb, but Bush was quoting from a 1991 IAEA finding when a much more recent IAEA report from 98 said there were no indications of nuclear capability in Iraq, which tended to confirm that those had been destroyed. So we were getting a lot of these messages, conflicting messages, the administration saying one thing, and then other agencies and uh, reporters and so on saying another. And by the way, I uh, heard in the news that coming out tomorrow is a theatrical movie, uh, it's not playing here tomorrow, I checked the newspaper, called Shock and Awe, and it deals with the difficulty with the media not getting the word out about whether Saddam had weapons of mass destruction or not, and how some in the media, particularly uh, even Judith Miller of the New York Times, was um, kind of promoting the war, not looking at some of the uh, research and reports saying, wait a minute, hold off. You know. Also that month and shortly into September, Paul Wolfowitz was saying, um, talking about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, as if they definitely existed. Uh, Rumsfeld, no doubt, there are weapons of mass destruction. Ari Fleischer, if you remember, was Bush's press secretary, there's his picture. We know for a fact there are WMD there, and Bush himself, <coughs> Saddam, etc., etc. In September, Bush made a speech to the UN General Assembly saying uh, how Iraq was definitely expanding its uh, nuclear uh, or its uh, biological weapons capability. Dick Cheney that month on Meet the Press continued this drumbeat for war. Uh, talking about Muhammad Atta. You may recall he's what was called the 20th hijacker, Al-Qaeda operative. <coughs> and um, Dick Cheney saying that Muhammad Atta had a meeting in, as an Al-Qaeda representative, had a meeting in Prague with um, senior Iraqi officials, meaning there was a connection between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein connecting Al-Qaeda, which by now we were pretty sure had orchestrated 9-11, with Saddam Hussein. 
as if Saddam was involved in 9-11. Condoleezza Rice that month clearly saying there are contacts between Al-Qaeda and Iraq. As it turned out, officials in the Czech Republic concluded, they investigated this alleged meeting, and they concluded that indeed Mohammed Atta had been in Prague, but there had been no meeting with any senior Al-Qaeda officials. Rather, their best guess was that Mohammed Atta had come to Prague in the Czech Republic to get cheap airfare to the U.S. Now we come to the State of the Union Address in uh, January 2003. So we are about two months prior to the invasion. And um, so George W. Bush, as you see, was still trying hard to connect Al-Qaeda in 9-11 with um, Saddam Hussein. And one of his uh, statements, the infamous, now infamous 16 words, he said, the British government has learned that Saddam Hussein was trying to get yellow cake uranium from the country of Niger, uh, uranium that could be enriched to make an atomic bomb. And interestingly, Bush had given a very similar speech to his State of the Union speech a couple of months prior in Cincinnati, Ohio. In that speech, he took those 16 words out. Not sure why, was it because he wasn't certain of them and something happened in the ensuing two months to make him certain? Or what? Nobody knows. Only he does, I guess. Well, those famous, uh, infamous 16 words turned out not to be true and surely Mr. Bush knew it, if not should have known it, because Ambassador Joe Wilson had been hired by the CIA to investigate this possibility months and months before Bush made this statement. Joe Wilson had gone to um, Niger, had reviewed all the documents that sort of said this had happened, found them to be extremely crude forgeries, and had debunked the notion that uh, Niger was possibly going to supply um, Saddam Hussein with enrichable uranium. He had made that report to the CIA. It's pr pretty inconceivable that the CIA would not have informed George W. Bush of that. Uh, so what happened, if you remember, Joe Wilson, on hearing Bush say this in the State of the Union address, sat down and wrote an op-ed to the New York Times which said, that's not true. <laughs> I've debunked that, those 16 words, months and months ago. And that led to a, a payback by Dick Cheney, remember Scooter Libby, his aide, revealing that Joe Wilson's wife was a CIA agent. Valerie Plain is her name. You may remember that. Uh, so, the rhetoric continued. The following month, February, about a week later, February 5th, Colin Powell made his speech to the UN holding up a little vial saying only this much anthrax or the like could be released by Saddam Hussein. He definitely has WMD. A um, couple of days later, Donald Rumsfeld said, if we invade Iraq, the war will last no more than six months. And of course, we invaded and it lasted twice as long as our involvement in World War II. The day after that, Bush said, we have sources that tell us Saddam uh, authorized chemical use of, use of chemical weapons by his field commanders, should we invade. Didn't happen, thank God. Daniel was there as part of that invasion. Um, so what were these sources? Do you remember the name Curveball? That was a guy who was an exiled Iraqi who, who evidently would say anything to try to encourage the U.S. to invade Iraq and overthrow Saddam Hussein because he wanted to go back. Ahmed Chalabi was his name, code name Curveball. He wanted to go back and run the show in Iraq. And we were relying on him, although um, there were probably good reasons not to. 
Two weeks later, Richard Pearl, one of the signers, if you remember, of that letter to Bill Clinton, said, uh, UN inspectors are being seriously deceived because we had, by this point, hundreds of UN inspectors, not just a dozen, you know, several hundred, crawling all over Iraq trying to find any evidence of WMD and they couldn't find it. The IAEA uh, director, Mohammed El Baradai, issued a report on March 7th, so two weeks before the invasion began, saying, we cannot find any nuclear weapons program. Now, the way they know these things, I took a few pictures of some of the inspectors. What they do is they go to a place where possibly there was some nuclear or even chemical and biological weapons being manufactured, and they take swabs, and then they analyze those in laboratories, and the experts in these matters say that if there had ever been anything with nuclear weapons being manufactured there, and then they swooped them all out before the inspectors got there, they say it is impossible to completely wipe clean all the evidence, microscopic evidence, of what had been there. And so they were doing that and they couldn't find evidence of weapons of mass destruction. Now, I should point out that way into the war, several years into it, some U.S. troops stumbled onto some rusting out, rotting canisters of chemical agents that had actually, some of them had stamps on them, that they were U.S. made, uh, that had come from the 1991 era, 12 years before our invasion. They weren't usable for any military purpose because they were rusted and rotting and leaking. And, and when our troops stumbled onto some of these canisters, uh, a number of troops, 15 or 20 troops, actually got sick. I don't think any died from it. They got sick because they didn't know what it was and they picked these up and they started to fall apart. Now, I'm pretty sure that if uh, the American people had thought, well, in 91, Saddam had some weapons of mass destruction, but it's 12 years later and we haven't found any evidence of that. I don't think the American people would have said, well, let's push ahead. But there was that found, and I want to make that clear. So now we are at uh, the next day, March 8th, still a couple of weeks before the invasion. Dick Cheney on Meet the Press telling us that Saddam was trying to hide his WMD and um, that Bin Laden had a cozy relationship. Al-Qaeda had a cozy relationship with Saddam. But in fact, that was not true. Bin Laden, previous to that, had called Saddam's regime hypocrites, apostates, and infidels because Saddam, I mean, Osama bin Laden believed that Saddam Hussein was too secular, he wasn't holy enough, he didn't, pay, he didn't follow the proper tenets of Islam, and uh, in fact, bin Laden hated Saddam for that reason. The following day, uh, March 9th, Bush again says, no doubt, weapons of mass destruction. And now it's March 18th in the U.S. And a little more about the media. The Washington Post had this headline, Bush clings to dubious allegations against Saddam. But it was on page 13 and we are about to launch a war the following day. And that's why I kind of see the media as somewhat complicit in this, for not pushing hard enough. Now, the next morning, you recognize that guy. <laughs> he got on the, in the well of the Senate and he made a speech. You can, uh, you can Google Senator Byrd and that date, March 19th, or Senator Byrd, Iraq speech. It is a chilling, chilling speech in which Senator Byrd said, how can we do this? 
It's a war of choice, not a war of necessity. Saddam's a villain, all right, but he's the wrong villain, and uh, this is the wrong war. I'd recommend, it's about, you know, a 20 minute speech. Very, very interesting and compelling. And that evening at 10 o'clock, so by now it was March 20th in Iraq, George W. Bush came on TV and announced the invasion. Three weeks later, this was what we saw on our televisions as our troops rumbled into Baghdad, Saddam and his allegedly fierce Republican guard. And I would invite you to come up and take a look. This is a, a uniform of a Republican Guard officer that Daniel brought home from uh, one of his two tours of duty in Iraq. Interesting looking. Come up, take a good look at it if you like. Uh, and Daniel was there when this statue was pulled down in another part of the city of Baghdad. He wasn't witnessing that. And he wrote us a letter that day. It was the first letter we got from him. We got it a week or two later. Um, you may have heard the wars declared to be over, but not really so. Of course not. By the way, that was his mother's birthday. I think it was her <coughs> birthday. I've forgotten exactly which one it was. Um, and Daniel talked of bodies in the street and so on. Richard Pearl, one of the architects of the war, said, kind of crowing about this, the, remember the people who said we would kill thousands and create new terrorists and the region would be set aflame? Uh, Tony Blair and George Bush knew better. Nope. Because that is exactly what transpired over the next months, weeks, and years. You remember this? May 1st, so we're about six weeks into the war. George W. Bush said mission, well, he didn't say mission accomplished, but he said the majority of the fighting is over. At that point we had fewer than 200 of our good troops dead. When it was over, more than 4,000 were dead. So we were not even, we were scarcely getting our toe in the water of all the death of our troops. The next day, Bush, people were starting to say, wait a minute, you've been there, we've had people there six weeks, why haven't they found the weapons of mass destruction and Bush? You start to hear a change of tone. We'll find them. Rumsfeld, we didn't think we'd just stumble over them. Nine days later, Condoleezza Rice is kind of backing off a little. We never expected we'd just open garages and find them. Nineteen days after that, George Bush was in Warsaw, Poland, and he got news that we'd found weapons of mass destruction. Two, and he announced it with fanfare. We'd found two mobile biological weapons labs. Paul Wolfowitz, one of Rumsfeld's top officials, said we found them. Colin Powell, we found them. Uh, no. As it turned out, that was premature. What actually, because we had inspectors go to those labs, take their swabs. They say if there had ever been chemical or biological weapons in there, it is impossible to totally scrub it clean of all the microscopic evidence and it's not there. What was it? These were uh, labs for making weather balloons, which our armed forces, they make them too. Colin Powell is the only person who ever really came clean about that and said, well, we didn't find them. Now let's skip ahead a couple of years. December of 2005, and George W. Bush even had to admit, much of the intelligence was wrong. But then he still says, Saddam was a threat to the American people. The world is better off because he isn't in power. You might argue that the world is better off. I don't know. Um, some debaters can debate that. But he certainly wasn't a threat to the American people. He didn't have WMD. And even if he'd had them, had no way to deliver them to the U.S. Now, I'll turn it over to Daniel. He will put some flesh on the bones. And let's get this on the jacket. Put that in your coat pocket. I'll just clip it out. Right there. So you can... Okay.
Can everybody hear me okay? Is that all right? Okay, good. Um, what I'm going to do is just uh, read a couple pages of, uh, uh, out of the book. Of, uh, this is a letter that I've written home uh, to my parents during, the, uh, during 2003, uh, which was the first deployment to Iraq. Uh, dear family, and actually this is, uh, I'm, I'm writing this from a, uh, a schoolhouse that we occupied in a town called Karbala, Iraq, which is about 50, 50 miles or so south of Baghdad. Um, and this is um, July 11th, 2003. Dear family, less than 24 hours ago, uh, my unit as well as several other uh, units throughout town simultaneously took several mortar rounds. It was just after 11 p.m. local time and I was getting ready for bed. Uh, I had a cot and was listening to uh, music on my, as I laid on my cot on the rooftop of our building. Uh, I heard a small explosion in the distance behind me, but I really didn't think too much about it. Uh, this was usually a nightly occurrence. Uh, what I failed to realize was that this explosion this time was the launching of the first of several mortar rounds that uh, were lobbed at our building. Um, and uh, the, the first mortar round actually missed high as it sailed right over our building. The thunder of the impact shook the entire city block. I reached to my side for my rifle and without a second thought, racked around. I looked over the edge of the rooftop just in time to see a second and third impact of a, a two more additional mortar rounds. Um, luckily all three uh, mortar rounds had missed high and gone over top of our building, but still landed within our, our complex. Um, the air was filled with dust as people were running about trying to figure out what had happened. I can remember in an instant the same feeling that went through my mind on numerous, numerous previous occasions during the war. Um, I knew I needed to uh, get my Kevlar vest and my helmet on. Um, with the exception of my M16, all my other gear, such as the vest and the, the helmet, were inside the building on a different floor. <laughs> uh, without really thinking about it much, I went back inside and grabbed my, the rest of my gear and ran down to the ground floor. Um, it was a circus-like atmosphere with everyone running around in their shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops. Some were yelling to get out of the building, others were saying it would be safer inside. I decided uh, that with a, a uh, somewhat busy road that went right in front of our building, uh, this may be the perfect time to uh, finish up the mortar round attack with a car bomb. Um, and uh, and uh, I chose to run back to the roof and take up a position, position. I thought this may be the safest place as they had already missed three times and had proven themselves to be clueless when it comes to adjusting their fire. Uh, so even if they hit the building, I thought I may, may be able to ride out the collapse of the building as opposed to being crushed underneath the rubble had I stayed inside. In about 20 minutes, a posse had been rounded up of several Marines uh, to go out and patrol the area. Um, those Marines uh, discovered in some tall grass uh, next to a, a second school building uh, nearby. In that grass, there were pathways uh, that looked like they'd been there for a while, maybe a week or so. Um, and in that tall grass, there were PVC pipes with, that were used to uh, launch the uh, mortar, mortar rounds from. Uh, they were stuck, stuck in the ground. I couldn't help but notice they were aimed straight at our building. All that had prevented several of us, several of us from being killed was about a half inch to an inch of dirt that needed to be added to adjust the angle of the launch tubes. Fortunately, no one was injured at our location. Uh, we arrested the school's headmaster for not reporting the insurgents who set up those mortar tubes. Uh, at this hour, I can hear helicopters in the air circling our, uh, as our ground troops conduct house-to-house -house searches 
that will continue over the next several nights. None of the local civilians we have employed for various jobs at our building are now allowed inside. It has been real quiet at our front gate today. No protests, no crowds, just real quiet. Uh, they know we have become relaxed. We've been doing battalion physical training, runs through the streets of Karbala, and having field days and cookouts. It's as if we were still back in at our base in 29 Palms, California. We were even planning on uh, doing short humps or hikes through the city. All very foolish decisions. There are lots of, there's lots of gunfire every night, sporadic gunfire throughout the day. We're continually on, uh, we are continually discovering threats and plots against us and taking weapons from uh, people. I don't know who comes up with or allows this foolish behavior to continue, but their, their luck is about to run out, which also includes me, uh, my luck. Um, the next time they roll the dice, I think something bad may happen. I had to get that off my chest. I'll give updates as I can, but for now the madness continues. Dan. Um, okay, I've got some photographs here that uh, that I was able to. Okay. I think it's the one on the right. Okay. Um, these are some photographs I took throughout my time in Iraq. Uh, this is during the invasion. This is along Highway One, which runs uh, from Kuwait north to Baghdad, uh, and this was just a common sight along the roadway there. That's uh, some, those are Iraqi soldiers that had been killed. Um, that's me in the foreground, and the gentleman in the, the white, uh, and the uh, gentleman to his left are uh, Iraqi prisoners of war that we captured. Uh, and this is just somewhere in the desert of Iraq during the invasion. Um, and that's uh, uh, me giving uh, some water to one of the one of the prisoners of wars or detainees, whatever you want to call them. Um, this was um, a, a site that uh, wasn't too uncommon after you know we'd been there for several weeks and the statue had been pulled down. People started to come out of their homes and you know, we got a lot of the thumbs up and they were curious to see us just as we were curious to see them. Um, this is the Iraqi dinar which is valued at like uh, I think in the negatives now. It's not even worth the papers printed on. Um, that money was lying around all over the place over there as soon as the invasion started. Of course it you know, that's when the value of it, which it wasn't worth a whole lot to begin with, that's when the value of it just went completely down. Uh, these are uh, Iraqi uh, weapons that we confiscated. This was a common sight. Um, each Iraqi home was allowed to have one rifle uh, for protection. Um, but, you know, as we would gather these up, this is probably you know, almost on a every other day basis, we'd confiscate those and uh, destroy them. Um, and these are some three Iraqi boys that I met, uh, and they are. And this is just downtown. Uh, in uh, I think this is in Karbala, uh, not Baghdad. Uh, the interesting thing here is that, you know, of course there wouldn't, we, we couldn't, I didn't speak their language and they didn't speak mine, so, um, but they were just boys having fun. They wanted to each have me take a picture of them wearing my sunglasses. So there's the boy on the right, the boy in the middle, and then the boy on the left. Kids being kids, right? So um, I thought that was interesting that they just wanted me to take, the, even though they would never see those pictures. <laughs> so, so anyway. Uh, I know. So uh, anyways, more more of the uh, more kids out. So see in the lower right hand corner, we've got you know another thumbs up. 
I can tell you that that changed during the second deployment. We didn't see stuff like that, like what's in this picture. Uh, this is the front gate of our schoolhouse that we occupied that I just read about. Um, here they have got, uh, there's a large protest going on outside the front gate. Um, that was a common occurrence usually because, you know, we, we'd made these promises like we're going to get your water turned on, you're going to have electric 24 hours a day, and it just wasn't happening. And, you know, so we're getting tired of it. So, um, <clears throat> this is a little closer up picture. And uh, this is the, uh, yeah, this is the son of a uh, Iraqi civilian that would come to our front gate. Uh, he'd been there several times before. He asked me one day, he said, can I bring my son? He wants to meet an American soldier. And I said, sure. And so when he did, uh, uh, I gave him his son that little American flag and uh, uh, a couple other little things. Um, my little rank insignia, uh, I gave him a little uh, pin there. It's on the center of his, his shirt. Um, which I thought about that later on. Maybe it was a mistake to give that kid an American flag. You know, I just because, you know, Plenty of people over there that didn't like us, and that made me hope maybe the father was smart enough to say, oh, "Let's just put this away until we get home," you know. Um, but uh, we would often, uh, uh, you know, there's no trash pickup service over there, so uh, we'd take our trash out into the uh, an Iraqi landfill, and a lot of times. Most of the time, as soon as we pull up, the truck would just get swarmed with Iraqi civilians looking for you know, whatever they thought we'd have in leftover food, uh, anything, anything of value that they might be able to use. There were people living in these trash dumps, and uh, there was one instance in particular where we just there were a lot more people than what you see in this picture, and we just we were overwhelmed, and we just had to basically abandon the vehicle while they picked through the trash and. And I remember during that instance, there was a, an old Humvee battery that somebody picked up out of the back of the truck and threw it down in the crowd and it hit a little kid on the head and uh, injured him pretty badly. Uh, it was just, you just, there wasn't anything you could do about it. it was, you just had to let it go. Um, but uh, and there they are, digging through the garbage. Just on some patrol out in the desert. Uh, this boy, he lived across the street from our front gate, and he was sort of uh, the ones of us that worked the front gate at our, the schoolhouse that we occupied. We got, of course, you know, again, we couldn't, we didn't speak the Iraqi, and they, you know, they didn't speak English, so. Uh, but we were able to kind of figure things out, and he was our gopher. He'd go out in town, we'd say, you know, go get us this, that, you know, whatever, and he'd go get it and bring it back, and we'd give him a little bit of money. And, um, so, uh, this is the uh, donkey pulling an ice, or pulling a cart, which is full of blocks of ice. And that was something to get that. Uh, because, you know, that was so many weeks of drinking hot water. That was very nice to have that ice uh, delivered to us uh, from a local ice factory. This is the family uh, that lived, this is a family that lived in that school building with us while we occupied it. And they lived there because the uh, father of the family was the had been the janitor at the school prior to the invasion, so our higher up people worked out a deal to allow he and his family to continue to live there. Um, so as you can see, they had several small children, um, and uh, this is, picture was taken early one morning before they had woke up for the day. 
we basically we let the kids have the run of the the, the building. Uh, these are a couple of translators that also worked for us. Uh, they were both uh, professors at the University of Karbala. Uh, there are there's one of the translators with me and uh, two of the two of the kids that lived with us. You see, one of them's got a Scooby Doo shirt on there. So, uh, I don't know if that was just given to her by, you know, maybe it had been sent to one of the troops by a family member. Uh, and she, that girl on the left was the oldest, so we, we kind of had the most interaction with her, and it's interesting that her mother asked a couple of Marines that were there if they would be willing to marry her daughter. And uh, so, <laughs> um, oh, okay. Um, and interestingly enough, talking about um, the, uh, the mortar attack uh, that we had, and I thought, well, maybe this would be a good time where they'd follow up with a car bomb to be driven right through the the front gate of the building, which didn't happen then, but it happened later after I had left there and come back home to the United States. Um, Hungarian troops occupied our, our building, that same school building, and uh, insurgents did in fact drive a car bomb through the front gate uh, uh, where I'd spent so much time in killed several of the family members that lived there, including the, the little girl on the right. So, uh, the others, I don't know. I don't know whatever happened to them, but I, I do know that that did happen. So, anyway, uh, that's all I've got. All right, take that. I'll finish up, and then I'm sure Daniel and I would be happy to stay for a couple of minutes chat informally. <clears throat> oh, here we go. So, whoa. Sorry about that. Maybe. If I move that down a little bit, can you still hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, so, just to conclude, um, oops. Here's a little update from just uh, last month. This guy, Muqtada al Sadr, is a, uh, an anti American cleric. He uh, would be sort of equivalent to a bishop, like the bishop of the United Methodist Church or the Catholic Church in West Virginia. But he had his own army. And I'm not talking about an army of in faith, I'm talking about an army with weapons. 30,000 of them or something like that. And he controlled them and at one point in the war he, uh, he said, well, if you kill Americans, good. Uh, he wanted us out. He considered it an abomination uh, that U.S. troops and bases were in Iraq. But the interesting thing is just last month, he won the election uh, as evidently as the new prime minister of Iraq. Uh, the votes were still being counted, and uh, but at the time I made this slide, uh, a week or ten days ago, it wasn't clear. Uh, his Mahdi army, he called it the Mahdi army, they've now been transferred, transformed into a social services organization. A step up, I guess. So I thought you'd appreciate that update. Couple, two or three final slides here. Back in the uh, 2014 uh, presidential campaign, uh, Mitt Romney said this, and it, it kind of made me stop and think. He said, if Barack Obama is um, reelected, all we fought for in Iraq is in danger of vanishing. And it caused me to say, well, what have we fought for? Well, as Condoleezza Rice put it, we fought to prevent the smoking gun from becoming a mushroom cloud, but we know now, I think, there was no smoking gun. Uh, we fought, as some people said, 
so that we could fight them over there, so we wouldn't have to fight them over here, but Iraqis had no way to fight us over here. Uh, we fought them to destroy Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was essentially non-existent in Iraq, although in the chaos after our invasion, it did grow a presence in Iraq and more or less was transformed into what we came to call ISIS. Uh, we fought for the domino theory of democracy that if uh, Iraq, the people of Iraq would love our way of life so much that they'd embrace it and then the neighboring countries would follow suit. It did not happen, did it? Uh, we fought because neoconservatives thought it would be pretty easy as Rumsfeld said, wouldn't last more than six months. He could not have been much more wrong, could he? We fought to destroy Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, which we now know did not exist. What had the war cost us? 4,500 U.S. troops dead, 30,000 wounded, somewhere between 100,000 and 600,000 Iraqi civilians dead. Um, and several million displaced from their homes as refugees, at least three million dollars in money. Um, that continues to mount because of disabled troops who'll need support forever, so on. We lost the moral high ground. Remember when after 9-11, people in many other nations were singing our national anthem in support and unity. We lost that, I think. Uh, and we suffered weakened relations with other nations and our national security actually declined I think because as the progress of the war played out and images of Abu Ghraib and things like that which never should have happened um, I think those helped recruit more terrorists actually so it, in a way we came became less safe because of this war are there heroes you're looking at some of them right there in my view and I dedicated this book to them, all the troops, and also to people like these. Some of you will recognize that. That is what the local Patriots for Peace group called the Wall of Remembrance, maintained by John Doyle uh, in Charleston. And each block that you see there has the name, hometown, uh, rank, uh, and date of death of a U.S. troop who was killed in Iraq and um, we brought these out I was part of that brought those out at times and this uh, was a visit to Charleston for a speech by Karl Rove uh, sometimes called Bush's brain so I think those are the heroes there's a picture of Dan more recent when he was promoted to lieutenant on the St. Albans Police Force. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much for coming, and I'll be very happy and Dan will to chat for a couple of more minutes if you like. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Richard Pearl was a big cheerleader for Shalabi. What's happened to those two? I don't know what Richard Pearl is doing now. Wolfowitz became uh, another one, became president of the World Bank, and then uh, there was some scandal uh, involving his girlfriend and da da da. So. But I don't remember what happened to Richard Pearl. Anybody else know? Yeah, well, we paid Shalaby a lot of money, I know that. Yeah, Shalaby, uh, he really, Shalaby really worked the system. What else? Any other? So would you always use a translator when you sent your runner off to get supplies? You're asking Dan that question. Uh, no, uh, we would just through hand gestures and maybe show them what you wanted. Yeah, pointing at pictures and drawing something, things like that. Okay. Uh, we kind of figure it out. Okay. Uh, and he probably picked up some English along yeah. the way. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that that was uh, I mean it, it was it, I was it was entertaining to have him come over there and because like I said you know I he was uh, he was our gopher and he he'd get us 
about whatever we'd ask for. So, um, one dollar. So, what else? How have you felt, Dan, on your return, people's response to you having fought in the Iraqi war? Um, it's overall, uh, it's been yeah, it's been been really positive. Um, you know, I, it, I haven't had anything like uh, you know during the Vietnam era. Uh, it was you know I not I've experienced nothing like that. No matter what what anybody's views are on the Iraq War, I've never had anybody uh, say anything to me or you know, make you know that was negative uh, uh, about about. Uh, my service or anybody else's service during that time. Any question? You know, on a side note, coming up here, driving up here from Oregon, we had a phone call, which is uh, interesting, we were all three in the car, from the father of a man who was in Dan's unit who did not survive. And we had, they live in, uh, they're in Kansas, right? Mm -hmm. And we'd maintain contact with them, and he was just calling to. Uh, we haven't heard from him in a long time. He was just calling. To, it was almost kind of creepy, but he was calling just to say, "Hey, haven't talked to you for a while. How are things going? And this is what the rest of our family is doing." And they, he, the parents had come to visit us. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometime in the past, and we went to visit them. Yeah, we to their house. So they have been here to the capital. When they came here, we gave them the mm -hmm. the grand tour, and uh, uh, he was uh, Christopher Wasser was the 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 There's Marine's that. name that I served with, who was killed, and he was killed in uh, just with the IED uh, roadside bomb explosion in April of 2004. So, yeah, it was it was ironic that his father called us on our way here today. <laughs> yeah, we hadn't talked to the, the, yeah. him for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the phone rang in the car and there he was. Mm -hmm. so. We got to know them because when they came back, when the, his unit came back to California, the parents went to the base to collect their son's things. <laughs> so they had all these pictures and things and they said, is there somebody, I don't know, somehow they got connected to you to explain what were all these things that they wanted to know what their son had done. You know, in the last few months or whatever, and have somebody talk to his him friends, about people that he knew. And right, yep. right. He brings having you brings them closer to their son. Right. Yep. So and Dan did. had seen their son much more recently than they had, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, that meant a lot. Yeah, so they talked about their pictures. And if they, yeah, they uh, his Christopher Wasser's parents. Uh, they would actually were there at the base when we were came back from that second deployment and of course they bust us in and these big greyhound buses and and uh, but his parents you know even though they they knew that their son was not going to get off any of those buses they still made the trip from Kansas to Southern California uh, to see everybody else come home and uh, you know they you know, they took me out to lunch and they said, well, you know, we'd like to take you out to lunch. And of course they would ask me things that, like, when's the last time you talked to him? How did he look? You know, what, what did you talk about? What did, you know, what, what did he say? And, you know, so um, and I answered as best I could. Uh, and, but I didn't, I didn't mind to do it at all. Uh, and so we've been, stayed in contact with, with them as as well as some others uh, from my time in the service. By the way, now our hour is over and we're five minutes beyond it and I promised that I would not go over and I've done that five minutes already so I think we must stop the formal part of this presentation but thanks very much for coming and if you want to buy a copy of that book I'll be glad to sign it for you. Thank you. And if you want to come up and take a closer look at this, yeah. grim though it may be. <laughs>
And did you take that off a dead officer or? He can or, make up a good story. Okay. Yeah. 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 Was it a prisoner? <laughs> no. no, that was an item that uh, I had, I bought that. First deployment, I believe it was. So it was a, and there's a vendor that had some of that stuff for sale. Wow. There and, uh, okay. Yeah, I did. It's I, really heavy. Yeah, I think the, the, the trousers are in there too. Yeah. As well, but, yeah, I could see that, but um, still. So anyway, uh, yeah, that was. I thought, well, I'll buy a couple of those. Did it have all the metals on it too? It, it has some metals attached to it. Uh, I've got several of them. Uh, I, uh, uh, sure. Yeah. 